best time for the brown trout is obviously uh, fall, October, even November. Those fish will run all the way until November. I've seen them all the way into November. But October, usually the 6th until the October 6th until October 31st is when you see them in there. The funnest ones I've always thought to catch were the fresh ones, the ones that are running right out of the lake. That's why the prime time is about the 6th until the 20th, I would say. After the 20th, you still get some fresh running brown trout out of the reservoir in, into the <coughs> river. Um, but they're kind of beat up. Most of the fish that are left in there. So that one was big fun. Mike again. So migratory versus resident. We do find resident fish in there. You will find a lot of rainbows, mm, 10 to 15 inches, some cutthroat as well, and some brown trout live in there year round. And you'll notice the difference in the colors of them. You know, they get the big spots on, but they don't get quite as orange as the fish do running out of the lake. Uh, the Snooky brown trout. We, we've always laughed about that for a year. They actually get, um, you'll catch fish that are 20 inches long, but they'll weigh six pounds. They're just short. You've seen them out there before. So we always laugh to call them the Snooky brown trout out there. So. Did you guys ever see, anybody see that South Park episode? Uh -huh. <laughs> Never seen The Jersey that Shore, like that's the little gremlin critter that they portrayed her at on, on the right. <laughs> Usually for clothing, I tell a lot of my people to dress, bring stuff like it is wintertime. The weather changes so much out there. I mean, it is Colorado. Um, some days I'll hit 60, 70 degrees plus. And then other days I'll come out there and it has been cold, snow blowing sideways, just not fun. So I tell a lot of people to be prepared with, with extra clothing just in case you might need it. Um, rods and reels. Usually really fast five weights, six weights, and even seven weights for fishing streamers. We do get some opportunities to fish some streamers, and you do get some opportunities to actually throw hoppers and get those big fish to come up and eat hoppers. They're big, they're big, dumb weight fish. The flies that you fish sometimes are pretty ridiculous. You almost laugh about them, but they do work. So the hoppers, and usually when I start fishing the hoppers, is I'll notice they'll start eating the thingamabobber indicator. So you go out there and you throw it out there and you have a 10 pound fish Next come up down. and devour the indicator. That's when you bring up a five weight with a hopper, you know, paint it or shark shoe, something stupid, and you'll actually have fish come up and eat it. Especially early. Right, right about now, those first couple of weeks, they'll start looking up for them. Um, leaders and tippet, a lot of it is, um, gotcha. we use what's called a, Kind of like a 90 degree rig. We use a loop that we tie our thingamabobber off of, and then we just use straight fluorocarbon coming off of it. Fluorocarbon that you buy at Bass Pro Shops. Usually I fish uh, 15, and I build it down you mean about 12 or 8. What's that? You buy a car of skies, you mean? Oh, yeah. Not, 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 not. <laughs> I my stuff in bulk. I go out there with bulk. I don't run out very fast. But yes, Thea carries all the appropriate stuff for you guys. Um, usually I'll use 8 to 12 pound fluorocarbon. Big hooks, don't want those fish to get away. You hook them, you, you set them good, and you be aggressive with them when you fight them. That's the only way to win them. Towards the end, that's that's in the beginning of the season, the first couple of weeks in October. Towards the end of October, when you got, go into November, you do have to start going down to 4X, 5X, and it's a big challenge if you hook a 30-inch fish because they run. They will run very, very fast. And a lot of times, if you don't really watch that reel, they're clinging on that first run. So in the beginning of the season, we use bigger, heavier stuff. Um, Later in the season, we go lighter, more technical, smaller flies because they, they've been used to being fished too. You can run a straight leader out there, that's no problem, especially if you want to be moving your indicator all the time. The problem with this rig, in order to move your, your uh, length and depth, is you have to cut or add tippet. But it seems very fast. So when you get a tapered leader like so, if you put your indicator way up your high, this part's going to seem fast because this has, doesn't have very much. Uh, uh, thickness to it. And the thicker that you get up here, the slower that thing so sinks. So the reason why we designed this rig is to sink real fast to get down deep in those holes and keep your flies down in those holes. And so what it is, is I run just a piece of straight 20 pound off my fly line, do a do a knot straight to the uh, thingamabobber so the thingamabobber can actually move around in like, the loop. Like a unit knot? Then, yes. Okay. And then straight off of the loop I tie just a straight piece of 12 pound and then I build my leader off of that. So I go 12 pound down to 10 and then down to my 8 that I'm actually fishing 
if I'm going bigger, then I'll use bigger to build it. But the thinner that it is, the faster that it sinks. It's a, it's a trick that we use on the brine pan a lot. Rather than fishing a tapered leader, we actually knot a piece of yarn to the leader and we run straight 5x off of it. So we'll tie a piece of yarn just like that to our leader, do a clinch knot of 5x straight off of it, and then we actually run a nymph rig and it sinks right away. So it's short, it's fast sinking. But so you don't have to use a lot of weight. You want to do it real quick? Mm. Take my beam of all right. Usually I cut off this tag thing. I don't use that too often. So I do just an overhand knot. You can make them as small as, or as big as you want. The one I'm talking about there is a loop. So right here, you can see I've tied my loop, and you've got your thingamabobber that slides back and forth on there. And it's just a slight movement. It really doesn't hurt the fishing at all. And then just straight off of that. It's a 3 x so We use this a lot on the growing board, Colorado. And we'll use it, I use it everywhere. I fish quite often if I'm nipping a lot. So you tie just an overhand knot for that, that knot there. That's actually... <laughs> Years ago when I was a spin fisherman, that's actually the Rapala knot. That's, so that's how I learned it. It's not just stuck with me over the years. If you go to knots and rigging on the website, it's I've shown you how to set that up. Okay. And then I just right. do, so now I got my loop. This is just 3x here, but I just do a straight, straight clinch knot right off the face of that. And it actually does turn over very well. If you get super thin, so if you did straight, 5x off of there, but you get 10 feet of it, you'll have a hard time rolling it over. That's why you have to taper it like a leader to an extent. Can you just tie another unit knot? What's As opposed that? to a clinch knot, can you just tie another unit knot? Yeah, over? you can use any any knot that you want. I just use the improved clinch. I've used it for years, and that's my go-to knot. Yeah. You guys and that's tied to your to your loop motion? Your mm -hmm. unit knot? Yeah. You guys can pass it around and take a look at it. She so can't change the depth on that, she just basically get the you do. right? You do. You take it off. Do you, you have to cut the clinch knot, you, you have to add, add another <laughs> section of, of uh, tivet, and the clinch right. blood knot, or if you want to take out a section, you just cut it and shorten it. Got it. It's, okay. it's, when I'm fishing, if I, if I know during the day that I'm going to be moving my indicator a lot, I'm going to be changing my depth a lot, I do not run that rig when I'm out there and I know I just want to be deep and heavy, then I'll run that rig right there. Whether I'm dragging bottom or not, I know I'm down there on the bottom. Okay. The little bobber moves there, but it actually makes your bobbers last a really long time. I mean, I've had loops with the indicator tied on there just like that for, I don't know, a year. They're still on there. So this time, this time of the year up there, I think a little bobber that big is not going to freak me. No, not, not in the beginning of the season. And it just depends on how shallow the fish are sitting. If the fish is sitting in this much water, no, I would not throw it. I would use a pinch on float, a little piece of yarn, real light rig, hardly any weight, but still the heavy tippet. Just so, just so it doesn't smack and scare the fish. Right. But in a deep run, that's perfectly fine. Those fish seem to sink it under really well, and you don't really miss a strike too often. It flows pretty low, low too. Right? It's low right now, well, yeah. Actually, Usually. my buddy just texted me about five minutes ago, said they bumped the float to 250. Ooh. See, that's yeah. just yeah. That's, that's, that's one of those. So when those big <coughs> fish do that push, they'll sit. A few fish always run. Um, so when the flows are well, a few fish run up and they hide in all the deep pools and that. Usually when you, when you hear that big flush like that, that's when all those big fish that are sitting at the mouth of the reservoir, that's when all of a sudden they run. So the next couple of days, you'll probably hear some good fish. If they just bumped it up, you'll probably hear some big fish being caught out of there. We'll be so, there tomorrow. <laughs>
Um, <laughs> um, they, they actually hide. So I've stood on all those tall banks and watched how fish react to fishermen out in there. And that's how I found all my, my hiding places. And where those actually, a lot of people think those fish fish swim back and forth to the lake. I don't think so. I think, think when they're in there spawning, they hide. And they hide under all those big rocks in there. If you actually go and stick your foot under a lot of those rocks, they're all of them. So that's where I catch most of my, that's those, those two, that morning where we caught those two giant fish, that was under a rock about this big. We never saw the fish, never saw a tail sticking out. It was just, just a trap. But the thing is, is we had sat and watched fish run and hide underneath that rock. We'd watch the big black shadow swim up the river and hide right in there. And you wouldn't see them come out. So that's where they would go hide. So, you know, when they're doing that, the blind fishing, you're, you're not really looking for them. You kind of see the fish swimming through the river in front of you. You know they're moving up. When they're actually out on the nest, they blend in very, very well. They're very, very hard to see. I've stared at a nest for 20 minutes before looking to see if there's a fish and never seen a fish and then moved up on it and a big fish does kick off of it. They're just very good at blending in with it. A lot of times I, I sit back and just look for the shapes, look to see the mouth opening and closing. That's a big trick with a lot of sight fishermen is looking for that mouth and it is actually very, very effective. Seeing just that little bit of a white, you know, seeing a darker, darker trout shape on top of that gravel is almost how you look for them. And then sometimes you'll look and look and look and there just won't be one out there. That's, a, that's actually a very pretty brown. That's very typical male brown trout in there. I would just want them just downstream catching, you know, probably 23. So I thought that fish was, but it was just such a neat fish. I had to take a picture of it. Um, His tail is huge. They're very, very wide. They're, they're yeah. strong swimmers. The one thing you'll notice when you hook these fish is if you've ever been salmon fishing, it's a lot of like, you hook them, they jump four or five times, they'll run you into your back and downstream, and it's all about you keeping up with the fish. That's how you land them. So they, they exactly run you right into those rocks. I mean, they're, they're, they're vicious, that's why we do that. But uh, as far as presenting with live, we've talked about that a little bit. Lost flitch out when it's going down deep in the pools. Not too much that you, you're snagging fish, but enough that at the end of your drift, you should see, see your indicator tap the bottom. That's almost how I gauge you know that you have enough. But get into a pool, fish it for a while. Nothing, add a little bit more split shot, just slowly, you know, figure out what the fish want, and then you kind of figure out a rig that they want in that certain spot. Um, moving up and down your indicator, just the same. Well, a lot of times when they when they eat it uh, in there, they usually take it under. There's no doubt that something's got it. It's not rarely I see in that river is light. Sometimes on the where I grew up fishing the frying pan, the roaring fork, the frying pan, your indicator just barely tap. And when the water's really low, that's what the fish, how they strike. And it's very hard to teach people to set the hook on that because a lot of times your first instinct is that's bottom. Mm -hmm. So out there, I've never, never seen him get super technical with uh, white eat. A lot of times, you, I mean, you know, it stops, it goes down. It's like you hook bottom, almost. Um, Sometimes you think you got veg. You do, and then the vegetation <laughs> you starts to big head up. shake. Uh huh. And then they, they start to cruise. Um, a lot of big fish do that. They don't quite realize that they're hooked at first. Then they just slowly start to go and then they really go. Um, Firing landing, like I said, keeping up with them, keeping that good downstream pressure is always a big thing. Turns their head, wins the battle so much faster. Um, keeping that rod right over the top of them, staying close to them. Now, a lot of times we get them. If they get too far upstream or too far downstream, I'll get, a lot of times I've seen a lot of big fish lost that way.